so I'm going to try to give a talk about the microbiome, and unfortunately it will not be uh, as much on soil since I know less about that, but I appreciate it deeply, but more about animals and, and particularly humans. And to give you an idea of the opportunities we have to do things differently, and I hope in a more useful way relative uh, to health. So first, uh, oh, two definitions, I'm sorry, back up. Uh, the microbiome, uh, for those that may not be familiar, the microbiome is really the collection of bacteria, archaea, viruses, fungi that inhabit a particular site. It could be a body site, it could be an ocean, it could be your acreage, uh, a particular niche, could be the upper atmosphere, and it is that collection of organisms that uh, are present. And then the superorganism <clears throat> is the combination of all the species that go together to operate as a single organism. We're a superorganism. A coral reef is a superorganism. And the other ther term I'll talk about is colonization resistance a little bit later in the talk. So I want to point out that Earth is primarily a microbial planet. That is the, the most significant, major, prevalent life form on Earth. And that they were, they've been here a long time, probably been here before us. And as a result, when we talk about managing and helping heal Earth, we're really, you know, the, the microbes are a benchmark. They are something we can measure and, and a good indicator of what's going on. They're in the upper atmosphere. They're in all the extreme places on Earth. And I'll show you that we have kissing cousins in us that are in those places as well. So we are traveling as bubbles. We carry a bubble in. I carried my own microbes into my hotel room and encountered whoever was there before. And that's, uh, we spread them. We're like the Johnny Appleseed of microbes because we're mobile. We get on airplanes. We go places. There, I'm going to have to reach out. So I did want to point out that uh, there are things called extremophile bacteria and archaea that used to be bacteria, but now they have their own kingdom. And these live in very extreme conditions uh, under Antarctic glaciers, 300 feet beneath eating minerals, rocks. They eat rocks. Uh, the Great Salt Lake, uh, Yellowstone geysers, the bottom of the Marianas Trench. And they're in our gut. They're in our gut. You have them because you have extreme places in your gut. So we really have a connection to life at the most extreme places, places you wouldn't think life exists. It is. It does. It's microbial, and it's in us. Oh, can this be activated, that screen, so that I can see the slides? That would help. Otherwise, I'll come down briefly. It helps to know what's up next. So the microbes cycle, and that is the microbes in your fields. Some of them can go into the atmosphere. Uh, we have a Pseudomonas species that is the rainmaker, and um, it can go from plants up into the atmosphere. It causes water to freeze at temperatures that are above freezing, makes snow, it rains. There is cycling going on, soil, plants, animals. And so think of it as a continuum, because when I show you where the microbiome exists in humans, for example, it's, there's no barrier to what's outside in terms of microbial life. So what you're doing with soil, with plants, with animals, reaches us both as food, but reaches us in other ways as well. It's one of the protective factors for human health when children can be on animal farms, for example. They're protected at risk of allergy and asthma. And they're protected because they're enriched, immersed in a microbial environment that they miss when they're in a megacity. So I, I'm sure you know more about this than I do, but I want to mention that root-associated bacteria, soil microbes, fungi in soils are the communication network. And you should assume that we are capable of communicating the same way th through our microbes. I believe that's a human capacity that we've not been taught and that we've not been using fully because we weren't as aware of it. So look at this model and think, you know, we can probably do that too. So plants that are attacked by aphids in a field signal through the underground mi microbiome to other plants 
that they're under attack, and those other plants change their gene expression to arm themselves against the, the attacker, the pathogen or the agent that's attacking. So if you have a disrupted soil system, disrupted plant system, you're automatically making plants more vulnerable. And that's why the job you're doing in managing ecosystems, and I believe we'll be doing more managing microbes, is where, where real health and regeneration occurs. So keep this in mind, that you are helping when, when you enrich these systems and you allow them to be robust ecosystems, you allow this to happen, you facilitate that. Natural resistance, natural protection against disease. So, we're a superorganism, but so are our livestock, so are our pets, our dogs. I'm obligated to show you some animals being with the Cornell Veterinary College, so you'll see a couple. But think about it like managing, we manage coral reefs, we manage tropical rainforests, we know how to do it. We should be managing ourselves, managing our livestock and our pets. Precisely the same way, as they're made up of thousands of species. Mutualistic commensal friends, and occasional pathogens. So just to show you that I didn't have a well-planned analytical career, the last seven to eight years of my career, and the reason I came to work on the microbiome was not because of training or a great, great plan, but because of a dream. So I actually uh, had a challenge, I had a challenge because I've worked on protecting babies and protecting young, uh, started with poultry and chickens, actually, in 77 at Cornell, then moved on to human health considerations, protecting the immune system of babies. And I had a challenge. What could you measure in a newborn baby that would best predict whether that baby would have a life filled with health or one filled with disease? And I thought, that's a really good question. And it was to write a paper on the answer. I thought I had this. I thought, well, I have 30 some odd years working on the immune system, I got this. And, and I spent a couple paragraphs writing, spent an afternoon, and it was garbage. It was terrible. And I went to bed, you know, like, oh, boy, I do not have this. I can't even convince myself. And woke up at 3.30 in the morning from this incredible dream. I don't really remember the dream that well. It's like, oh, wow, what a dream. I've been dreaming. Wow, do I have this idea? And the idea was, self-completion of the baby. That the baby's not complete until the baby has the, the largely maternally installed microbiome. And it is that coral reef formation, the equivalent in humans, that is the complete baby on the best trajectory for health. And we know things change, things happen, there are environmental exposures, you eat, things happen in terms of disease risk. But at that moment in time for the newborn, a measure of the robustness of self-completion of that baby would be the best measure. And so my wife helped me translate my dream ideas and write the paper and went into an obscure journal that we didn't think anybody would see. But, and there's the, there's the model basically where family sourced microbes are installed in the newborn baby. Skin, skin contact, natural childbirth, vaginal delivery when possible, the seeding. Breastfeeding when possible. So what do they do? Well, so, you know, you have exposure, maybe it's to uh, arsenic or lead or something like that, or it's to a food product, something you need. Well, some microbes will grab it up, they'll sequester it, they want it, they can hoard it. Others will avoid it, they don't want it, they'll exclude it actively. They'll metabolize it, that becomes very important. A lot of the drugs require microbial metabolism and the extent to which your drugs do it, the drug may be safe and work, ineffective, or like with digoxin, if you have the wrong amount of a particular gut bacteria, it can kill you. Physicians have not been measuring the amount of that gut bacteria, so it's been flying blind, so to speak. So they can signal, they can, they can make products and signal other bacteria, they can signal your mammalian cells. Some of them will die, they don't like it, it kills them. Uh, others will grow. They love it. They want more of it. And some of them sometimes occasionally can move. You don't want that. They have their own little niches. They're good in their niches. They're, they're usually good for you in their niches. Getting them into other parts of your body is not a good idea. Um, usually leads to disease. So those are the kind of responses that, that can occur. 
they have a remarkable array of functions. I'm only going to talk about a couple because, because of time. But the gut's been called the second brain for good reason. And I'll show you. There's more neurochemicals, neuroactive peptides made in the gut than made in the brain. And vagus nerve and there's some other routes that are used to communicate those where those peptides act in the brain. The microbes make, the bacteria make neuropeptides. I'll show you examples of that. They also regulate production by other gut cells, mammalian gut cells of that. So they're controlling a lot of the neurochemistry. So you start to look at mm, food cravings. You start to look at neurodevelopment, neurodegeneration, neurobehavior, moods, major depressive disorder. And you start to realize, well, a lot of that starts in the gut, and a lot of that starts with the gut microbes. And there's a whole area called psychobiotics now that is rebalancing your gut microbes instead of taking hardcore drugs with major side effects to deal with neurological conditions. So, um, they can regulate hepatic metabolizing enzymes, so they'll control what your liver does as well through the signaling. And the immune system has to mature, co-mature with the baby and the infant's microbes. And the reason is the immune system has come out of an environment that's in the womb, where the mother and the baby cannot immunologically attack each other and go to full term. So the immune system hasn't developed in a linear way. It's really developed in a bias to avoid the responses that would present this incompatibility problem. And that means things have to happen after birth, first thousand days, critical for a lot of the physiological systems, immune system. Lung takes longer. but So that is fine-tuned by the microbes. 60 to 70% of your immune cells are in the gut. Now, when I was teaching immunology at Cornell in the 70s, we taught just the reverse. A lot of what I taught, we now know, is not right. We were focused on the thymus and the bone marrow and whatever. The action is out in the tissues, a lot of it in the gut and the mucosal tissues, airways, gut. So if the baby does not co-mature, then there's a bias toward what I heard in the second talk yesterday morning, beautiful talk, talking about low-grade inflammation. Well, that baby is biased toward misregulated inflammation, and that is what underpins almost all chronic disease in the end. There's a, there's a bias toward that, there's blunted antiviral responses, there's, there's, some, there's some imbalances, and the cells are not distributed in the periphery, they're not distributed in the brain, they're not distributed in the skin, in your peripheral organs, in a balance that is good, because that has to be signaled by your skin microbes, by your gut microbes, but, you know, uh, they're actually signaling so you have tolerance and you don't have autoimmune disease later in life. So those are kind of three areas that I'm just going to talk about briefly. The rest, you can see there are other thing, important things, HPA axis, stress, um, hormone production. Again, microbiome has been called the missing endocrine organ. That was one of the first terms given to it. So a lot of activity all, uh, in your physiology. And this is a very complex slide. I mainly just wanted to show that there are windows and things happening in the brain and in the immune system during the postnatal first thousand days in particular, and that's where this co-maturation, cr the critical windows are where the microbes have to be in place for the best balance to occur. Now, this is not to send a signal that you can't do things in later life. I changed my own health in my 60s, changing diet and using particular probiotics to rebalance uh, once I knew what was going wrong with some of my physiology, and it has really helped. Uh, so you can change things at any age, but you get more bang for the buck early in life. That's where a lot of programming happens. You don't want to miss those critical windows and those steps in development if you can avoid it. So here's the example of specific bacteria, some species that make serotonin, some make dopamine, some make GABA, acetylcholine, and just changing the ratios of those will rebalance brain chemistry and will help a lot with mood issues. So I can see I'm actually going to need to move real. <laughs> I may have to skip some slides. I apologize about that. Uh, so either the balance occurs or you have uh, misregulated inflammation as a likelihood, and then it's a matter of how things will, will show up. Our microbiome in Western countries, like the US, has been estimated to be depleted by 35 to 40 percent 
compared uh, to the uh, Yanomami, uh, Amazonian, indigenous peoples in, in uh, Venezuela and Brazil. And um, people right now are trying to, okay, thank you, trying to um, actually recapture some of the missing microbes. Uh, you can't actually import them in, but people that are actually children between Western anthropologists and royalty in the Yamamani can travel back and forth. And it's interesting, you can monitor their microbiome as it changes as they go back to the more natural conditions in the Amazon and then come back here and eat food for a few days and then go back. But they can actually, just with what they, what they have inside them, help us see what we have been missing. And some of those are really important. Things like microbes that will reduce blood pressure. So we need to restore us, but if you don't restore the soil and the plants and the livestock, we can't get there either. We can't get there. Okay, six factors, and this is in my book, uh, that led to this. Uh, antibiotic overreach, prophylactic use. I, I was hired in the poultry department at Cornell. I railed against prophylactic use of antibiotics for growth promoters, um, installing it in the environment, and then overprescription, uh, you know, in cases of things like ear infections or the like, where physicians are now, under, pediatricians are understanding, maybe some of these we should wait two or three more days and see if it's viral. Um, because every round of antibiotic from zero to one year of age has a very measurable impact on risk of asthma at five to seven years of age in that child. Every round, it's not just that you can see a difference, it's every round it's incrementally more. It's not to say you shouldn't use antibiotics. They're lifesavers. They saved us through the 20th century, but we have not understood risk benefit. Oh, sorry. Well, yeah, there's the food revolution, processed foods. I found it really enlightening that processed foods retain flavor. Uh, you know, I used to be told when I first had rattlesnake to eat at some food festival, it's like, well, it tastes like chicken. Well, chicken doesn't taste like chicken when I was growing up in San Antonio in the 50s. Chicken no longer does. And again, I was in the poultry department for 14 years before I went to vet, the vet college. It doesn't, because taste was not. It's interesting. Rare fish and figuring out how, to, how, how they can be used in food and getting them to taste good enough to do that was a priority. Meanwhile, chicken flavor was falling off. So. The idea is the food revolution and what we thought was benefit getting food to people had many unintended consequences that are, have been very, very detrimental. To give you an example, when I talk about safety in a minute, food emulsifiers, think how prevalent those are because the two most commonly used food emulsifiers are toxic for our gut microbes. And they will wipe out the mucin layer and open up the lining to being compromised. It's a route to metabolic syndrome, yes. That polysorbate ADB and car carboxymethylcellulose. So they make your food smooth, they destroy our lining and create inflammation. Uh, urbanization, our megacities, our microbial wastelands. We've heard talk about greening, but what the people should be doing is visiting you on your animal farms, bringing their babies out there because pregnant women and young children that grew up on animal farms versus an urban area a few miles away, this was a study in Germany, called it the German Barnyard Study, had a profoundly reduced incidence of allergic disease. It was originally called the hygiene hypothesis, but what it is is, is if you're immersed in that robust microbial environment, you actually have protection. So uh, I was asked at the pediatrician conference, well, would you ever use sanit sanitizers? I'm gonna go on a cruise in January. I will there because of norovirus. But uh, most places, no, you know, you really, it's risk benefit. And you don't wanna be destroying your skin microbes that are useful unless, you know, there's, there, again, the risk benefit changes. So 3,500 people packed in a small space, I might use it, but otherwise not so much. Birth delivery mode, elective cesareans, cuts the bond cuts the route in which mom donates the majority of the baby's genes. Vaginal delivery, skin-skin contact still being important as well. And there are strategies 
to use vaginal swabs and things like that to actually try to replace that even with cesarean babies. But we didn't understand that because a cesarean baby looked very clean and great for the first few months, that that was wonderful. You didn't understand that they were going to have pediatric celiac and atherosclerosis and diabetes later in life, you know, so as a cohort. So now we know, now we need to do something about it. Uh, and misdirected efforts at safety. Most of my career was safety for the immune system and studies. And I can tell you that because we never measured the microbiome, I'll show you a figure that we published recently, uh, that toxicologists don't know what's safe. All of human safety testing and screening was done without the microbiome being included in the testing. It was all geared for mammalian toxicity, and that's a problem. And the same thing with human medicine. If the majority of your genes and your metabolism is contributed by the microbes, then shouldn't you be having an annual assessment of where your microbiome is and have sequential measures so you can tell if something's damaged it? Or what dose a physician should prescribe? Or if you shouldn't be given a drug? Um, one of the examples is uh, the UK system did an analysis of cancer therapeutics. And they, work, they have to be metabolized by the, by the microbes to be active to get the active compound. They worked in 50% of the patients. If you measured the microbiome and installed the microbes that were needed to metabolize those cancer therapeutics, you're gonna elevate that. Why not? Why not? 50% of the people don't have to die. Okay, so mammalian-only human medicine, it requires education of physicians, but we really can't accept that anymore. It's just not the majority, it's not the whole human, not the holistic approach. So. This is almost a decade old. Nine years ago with some other colleagues, I published uh, what was intended to be to ask the question, if you had a child who was diagnosed with asthma or a group of children, if you had uh, other immune inflicted diseases, psoriasis, inflammatory disease, uh, recurrent uh, respiratory infections, uh, schizophrenia, uh, inflammatory bowel, what, what happens to that cohort? What diseases are they at an elevated risk for as medicine is practiced today versus either no, a null effect or maybe even lower? And the answer is there are comorbid diseases, chronic diseases that show up in those cohorts much more frequently. Uh, some of them make sense, some of them don't or didn't at the time. And this would be expanded dramatically. This was what the literature said in 29, 2010. Uh, so the point is, that cohort, not an individual necessarily, but the cohort of children with asthma are going to develop certain chronic diseases at an increased prevalence to the rest of the humans. So why wouldn't we do something about it? Physicians didn't know, but the point is you can't simply keep doing the same thing because these diseases kill 75% of the people worldwide. So you hear a lot about pandemics and infectious disease, but it's non-communicable diseases that are actually killing the majority of people. And in the meantime, they need polypharmacy. Every disease has medically coded prescriptions that go with it for the most part. So each one of these they accumulate. NCDs beget NCDs. They get more drugs, more doctor's visits. Oftentimes caregiver status changes as well. And we become isolated because if, I have a, don't have time for it, but an airplane exercise to show you that even getting on an airplane there are people that have incompatibilities with service animals or with peanuts or with fragrances or didn't used to be that way. Even throwing a child's birthday party now is, is a challenge. That didn't happen two decades ago. That's the change with the change in food and the way we've operated. Okay, so here's the obesity treat. It's in my book just to show you. So you have uh, childhood obesity has been increasing dramatically and here's what that cohort looks anticipates. 12 different cancers and 32 total chronic diseases. We should be preventing children being receiving that diagnosis. And if they do, we should manage them differently, not just the presenting symptoms of the day, but what's going to happen a decade or two later. Okay. okay. Breast milk is another important aspect because it provides not just immune components, colostrum even more important than breast milk, but breast milk provides immune components. They provide this uh, amazing component called human milk oligosaccharides that nutritionists used to say, why is it there? Because we can't digest it. 
Our mammalian cells can't digest it. Well, it's not for them. It never was. It's for the microbes. The microbes use it. And it changes. That's how, that helps microbes co-mature. Breast milk also has its own microbiome, and that is donated as well with nursing. It's absolutely critical when possible. You have the issue of should we actually have pasteurized banks of human milk or is raw milk better? Same thing, actually, raw milk with cow milk as well, a question. So it's another important component. Uh, and I just want to say that diet and, and the microbiome go together. You can drive changes in the microbiome with diet, but it's tough because if you grew up microbes eating fried chicken and you want to eat kale now, they know how to make you pain, make it be painful and put you in misery, and they will. So actually adjusting both, install the microbes that you want that'll use the diet that you're putting in as an energy source just makes sense. It makes sense. And there are many healthy microbiomes around the world. So they're linked to where your ancestors grew up, the soil, the plants that were there, and what they ate. And so for me, with ancestry back more in Europe and maybe some in Africa, to try and have the perfect uh, Asian microbiome would be a leap I should not probably try. In other words, there are plenty other healthy microbiomes that are much closer to where I probably am. This is just to show you, this was the model that's been used uh, from 1987 on how we look at human exposure and an internal dose and then lead to pathology clinical disease. And the National Research Council, National Academies developed it. And my colleague who co-wrote the article with me was on this panel. And that guides EPA and FDA and the regulatory agencies. But again, the problem is that they were missing the microbiome. And so we wrote a paper and said, you know, toxicology is great, and we got to make work for toxicologists because we don't know what's safe because that was never included. And that's actually what we need to do. So glyphosate, for example, is a bacterial toxin. How's that going to go? Not well. Not well in the soil, not well in our animals, not well in us. But a lot of things, again, in food, as food additives are a real problem. A lot of drugs, NSAIDs and antacids, can damage the microbiome to such an extent that microbiologists can tell you whether you've been taking naproxen or ibuprofen because they damage di differently. The pattern of damage is different. They can also tell a family whether they've been eating Singapore rice Indonesian rice or Chinese rice, or Japanese rice, I should say, versus Chinese rice, because again, there are differences in promoting microbiome signatures. So food, drugs, um, we need to know they're safe, and we need to know where we are with our microbiome. Uh, the final thing is to mention the other aspect of disease, colonization resistance, and that is blocking, using friendly microbes, mutualistic microbes, to block pathogens from gaining a foothold. And it's not just physical blocking, it's metabolic, it's, it's uh, taking up nutrients they need, it's actually their antimicrobials they'll make. They'll kill, bacteria will kill other bacteria, and they can do it. And it's maintaining that mucin layer, the blue layer right there. So this is what the food emulsifiers do. They take that down and you have bacteria that are getting the immune cells interested underneath, and they'll kill the lining and then you have leakage. Um, so commensals are really critical, and that's when you're, when you're doing what you're doing with the soil, when you're doing what you're doing with the farm animals, and when we do this for ourselves, it's absolutely golden. We should be taking maximum advantage of colonization resistance and then use drugs when this fails or other strategies. So I want to point out that it's not like we don't have a track record. I was in poultry in the 80s, late 80s, at the time when there was a salmonella out outbreak that involved New York State as well, and we had vertical transmission through the egg, we had spread horizontally, chicken to chicken, and we had a food safety issue where uh, humans stopped eating eggs. It was devastating for the industry at that time. So what did they do? They used something called, at the time, Nurmi concept by a Finnish researcher, and that was, well, what if we loaded the birds up with just lactobacillus acidophilus? We can do that. Just load them up, because we control their environment, we control their diet, and it solved the problem. And you hear a lot about antibiotics in the, it, prophylactically in the industry. You probably don't hear about this because this has been used. There's now 35 to 40 years of data on this being cost effective where there's only penny, pennies profit anyway in the producers. Thanks. Okay, so I am, so 
this works, and we should use this just as part of our managing microbes. So I need to wrap up and just to say that the microbiome status affects environmental chemical drug exposures, and we can use that to advantage. We can probably reduce side effects of existing drugs. We got some drugs that should not be prescribed because they're damaging us, and same thing with our animals. It determines efficacy, and it determines what your physiological response to food is going to be. You get, your, you, you get the garden you're growing in your gut in sync with what you're putting in to feed it, and you're going to be, in, you're going to be good to go. And I just want to introduce, if you, if you wonder about animals, I should tell you that dogs can sense the microbiome like nobody's business. Think about how they greet each other. Is it face to face? No. They're taking a fecal reading, you know, it's face, it's nose to tail, right? So this is Cliff. Cliff can identify Clostridium difficile, a life-threatening hospital-associated pathogen, bacterium. He can identify that in individual patients or, or with a hospital outbreak three days before any other instrument can identify it. They're measuring the volatile organic compounds. So imagine going into a doctor's office and getting breathalyzer for your microbiome. It's possible. So take on points. Uh, really, the holistic strategies you're practicing now, they go all the way to human, and we need to keep that going and uh, regenerate. Newborn immune system has to co-mature with the microbes. That's, that's what I told the pediatricians. That's their mission. It's absolutely valuable. And nothing's safe until we know it's safe for the microbiome. It's the majority genes. And diet is, is a huge part. So all you're doing to provide, to get toward healthy food, grown in an environment that is regenerative in terms of agriculture, is, is the foundation stone. And I just want to tell you that you hear about Alexander Fleming, who discovered penicillin. But he loved microbes. He painted in microbes. That's his bacterial art. So thank you so much. I hope I haven't gone over too much.